Hey guys, so we got something a little bit different this time. Uh, next week, I will have my uh, normal video style uh, video on Wendy Carlos. Uh, but for this week, I'm really excited to be bringing you a talk that I did with Max from Lamy Young. And we're talking about our hopes and dreams for the future of music education. So I hope you enjoy and see you next week uh, when I talk about Wendy Carlos. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna hit record. Flow in with it. Flow. Um, do you, you want, want to go to, first? Do you want to introduce yourself? I'll I'll, int I'll give you the sound by introduction. And awesome. Hello, my name is Max Alper. I am a musician, a composer, primarily. Uh, I make music under the name Paritsky, little project name of mine, uh, moniker. Um, I've been an educator of music and music technology and sonic arts for quite a bit. Uh, I'm a full-time professor in Puerto Rico teaching uh, sound studies and digital audio and music tech. And uh, for the past four or so years, I have run a, uh, what I have called weaponized music memory, weaponized sonic memory Instagram account called Lamim Young, uh, which is initially a uh, a little thing that I didn't want anyone to follow, and then uh, over the course of several years at this point, uh, has bloomed into a full-on Patreon virtual classroom, you know, educational, comedic but educational experience. That especially during COVID, it's like yeah it became it became more of a thing so that's been uh my other yeah. the teach my other teaching gig <laughs> yeah, for sure yeah which is it's great i'm on it and uh, i've done a couple of the lectures already uh thank you thank you sarah we learned we some learned some shit yeah <laughs> um so uh i'm sarah i um obviously run this channel sounds good um which is just a very new thing um, but I'm also a musician. Sorry, Max. I said, I love it. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's a, this is, I, I run this educational channel called sounds good as you probably know, cause you're watching this video. Uh, and I'm also a musician. I make music, uh, under my own name. Uh, that's more, uh, it's like, Full, fully electronic, more experimental, involving kind of uh, different approaches to to time and tempos, uh, etc. Um, and I also have been playing in a band for quite a while called Watering. Uh, we haven't haven't released anything since 2014, but we're actually working on some material right now, and that's more of an integrated um, electronic instruments. Uh, vocals and uh, electronics as well, kind of more experimental uh, pop kind of kind of vibe. Um, cool. And I uh, have a degree uh, in electroacoustics from Concordia University in Montreal. Um, and I've been playing. I've been involved with electronic music since I was. Um, well, I've been involved in music since I was a kid and playing the drums. I started playing the drums really seriously when I was like 13 or 14 um, and then got into recording audio when I was like a young teenager and then started making electronic music. So um, I've been involved in electronic music for, for a really long time um, and sort of ended up reluctantly in my electroacoustics degree. And then was when I first got there, I was sort of like, okay, how can I, how can I like get good enough grades and maximize the time I spend working on my own music? And then yeah. about two weeks in, I was like, what, what am I thinking? Like, I love this. I want to focus all of my energy onto it. So that's great. That's why we haven't released anything since 2014. Cause both my part, my working partner, Bennett and I, um, went to the program. So we both sort of just got super into it oh, and, um, into it. Come out the other side being interested in doing music education as well and that's going to be that's the subject of our uh discussion today fantastic um i think we both 
while we're both obviously interested in creating educational material um, and educating people. Um, and I would say that it's probably fair to say that we both have had um, experiences throughout our education that we are sort of maybe reacting to you that, mm -hmm. that uh, or I guess I'll just speak for myself. Yeah, like having, like I, you know, I had an amazing time in my degree, some of the most, um, you know, important experiences that I've had in terms of my music education and in terms of my music life, um, but also left feeling like I had some pretty strong criticisms of how things work, the culture um, around it and just music education in general and left with this feeling of like, there's so many people that are, are being left out um, and mm -hmm. There's just a lot that's just doesn't feel like it's kind of caught up with uh, with the moment and that um, there's a great need to evolve our uh, our approach to music education. And I think um, through through Max's Patreon and through his content on Lemming Young, I think um, very much have the sense that we're on the sort of on the same page with being like, what, how can we how can we bring music education into this this new moment um and we're trying to figure out how to do it as we go but have have lots of ideas about it i think would be maybe fair no, to totally say. i think that was one of the things that drew me to your account because someone i don't know who it was who initially sent it to me as just a a dm be like yo you should check out you should check out sarah's account you should check out sounds good like it's this new because i was always roasting youtube music ed culture right um in my in my shit in my memes and in like my own writing on the account and stuff like that just because like so much of it is and it's has to do with not just music technology but music ed in general music culture in general is like flashy spectacle over like substance of any sort of human emotional or just composite literal compositional uh you know and you see this in like fact magazine you see this in you know boiler room yeah well we're talking electronics specifically but yeah yeah but <clears throat> but seeing a channel such as yours that was you know informative and you know catchy in the right way without being like you know like a buzzfeed list listicle video you know what i mean right um yeah and those things i thought it was really unique and i appreciated about your work was uh clearly somebody had an idea like had the same thinking that i was where it was like you know there needs to be something different on this in your world the youtube sphere yeah you know? um it's something that i refused to touch I've dabbled here and there and I like uh, I was recording some lectures for classes at the beginning of COVID and I was thinking like oh I could maybe like start editing this and maybe put it into something more condensed and professional right. for like a non-class lecture style yeah. and no I was, no I was uh, like uh, I'm not video editing I'm not doing the effort involved that is required for this particular platform so bravo yeah. bravo to you for packaging it, packaging it in a way that is you know, not like con confronting, it's confronting the problems of that platform in the music ed world from the inside, you know, which I, I also, and you know, I also try to always say destroy the conservatory from the inside. So, you know, it's like, uh, I, I think uh, you're, you're on that track, which is, which is dope because <clears throat> There's different, there's different, obviously different layers to the music ed conversation, but the definitely the YouTube culture is its own bag, obviously, you know, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I think that like, I, yeah, it's definitely it's a response to, um, to yeah, the YouTube world, and also the like electroacoustic world that I come from the electronic music world, which mm -hmm. is like, it's whole other thing, like, you know, electronic music production stuff. Um, I was just, I've been, I've been like looking for, for jobs lately. And I remember sort of being like, maybe I could like teach online. Like I could find some kind of electronic music academy to apply to. And, and like, I looked at a bunch of them and it's literally just all guys. Like it's, 
it's oh, just of course all dudes and i was just like i i was like this is not for me at all like this space like i'm like people aren't going to take me seriously this no, place is like a nightmare like and boys club boys club on all on all regards and you know it's a it's a cis hero all the more you know every every single like you know type of uh what you would consider of to be like the boys club it, it is yeah and it's like you know it's a continuation of all of all music education culture and uh True. even specifically electronic or pop music culture in the behind the scenes right. audio pro audio side of it you know it's yeah, not anything audio, for sure. it's not anything it's not anything new at this level of like like normie music culture in that way but when you dig deeper you're like oh shit like there's there's hella there's hella black gay trans people doing like the the fucking you know foundations for for everything we're talking about even going back to you know like film score things that are as, as early as that you know it's uh right even things that are super mainstream wendy carlos you know all that shit yeah. there's a yeah the document <laughs> it's a documented history that a lot of people are just like willfully ignorant of at this, at this point definitely you know? definitely <laughs> yeah yeah and i think also i've been like part of my education has been in the, the classical music world as well um taken like a lot of i ended up taking a lot of classes in the in the music department at my university as well mm -hmm. and that's its own that's its own thing it's it, it's interesting like it was more like in my electroacoustics classes, I might have been the only, you know, one of two or or just the only one, like the only woman or like the only queer person or whatever in my class. And then in the music department, it's it's better. It's like more balanced um, in terms of gender, I think. Uh, but the music, the music music world has had, I mean, I I feel like I, it's taken me so long to feel like I deserve a space in that world at all. Like, I think I, you know, cause like I grew up in, in Saskatoon, there wasn't really like options, you know, I was interested in music. And so I wanted to get educated. I wanted to educate myself and it was like, well, you know, it's the conservatory, it's uh, a degree, like a, you know, just a traditional music degree or whatever. And all of the engagement that I had in those spaces made me feel so inadequate for not having this very specific kind of of um foundation for my knowledge like it's like if you unless you have followed this one specific path that they lay out for you which by the way is like so boring like it's you know yeah. you don't get to do anything interesting for the first like however many years like you don't you don't compose you don't you know it's just like scales and, and all this stuff and i wasn't really like I, I, you know, I can be, I can be extremely disciplined when I'm passionate about something, but like, I can't, I'm not very good at just putting my head down and like learning if the boring stuff, if I don't have some sort of motivation for doing it. And when I was like a teenager or young person, I didn't have that motivation. And so I didn't have those skills. And, you know, I remember like, I was like taking a test to get into some program, I guess it was at the U of S and, and like, you know, just like this memory of just sort of feeling like scoffed at you know for even being there like just for clearly right. just not belonging you know and um right. and i think this is something we can get into later in the discussion but i feel like i i now that i've gone through and i've taken those classes like had more confidence to assert myself in in that in those contexts i feel like um, the tonal education that I've gotten has been really, really essential to my music practice and my understanding of, of making music. And that's, you know, obviously going to be like, I think generally missing from electronic music education. It's, it's interesting, uh, talking about like that point in life, like your teens, when you're figuring out like, what the hell am I going to do? Yeah. Musically, am I going to go to music school or am I going to like DIY or die, you know, like that situation? Because yeah. you, sound, you sound very similar to mine where it's like, a, you know, you're a weirdo musically and you know you have to apply to some sort. You have to play some game 
right? You have to apply yeah. yourself into somebody's system. Yeah. But absolutely. where do you, how do you, where do you see yourself and where do you feel welcome is the question. For me, I was not a classical performance person in my like K through eighth grade, but I was a taking piano lessons pretty consistently throughout elementary and middle school. Yeah. Um, but more from improvisational, like jazz and blues primarily. Um, but even more than that, like the improv, the improvisational kind of composerly piano chops. Um, so pretty, pretty right. forward thinking for a fifth grade or whatever. Right. For you know? sure. Yeah. Um, but when I was uh, 13, I had my bar mitzvah and I got an iBook G4. Okay. And then okay. I u and then I used like the remaining $200 to get an M audio oxygen MIDI controller. Right. And at age, at age 13, that was, that was it. You know, like I knew basically from that point that like, not necessarily what type of music I wanted to make, but like, initially using both my vocals and piano chops because I also took took voice lessons traditionally as well and I consider myself a, yeah. a singer and have a vocalist in bands and choirs and other stuff but um by the time I got into high school it was like I'm starting to veer out of my punk phase and into just recording myself and my own songs uh initially some of them were pretty punk but then kind of I was like that punk to metal to noise to all things experimental trajectory of things right, you right. know very much like starting in the basement like DIY metal into noise culture was my like high school experience so right. it was pretty pretty weird and you know, and like post rock, you know, instrumental rock band stuff like that. You know, pet yeah. pet. What do they call? What do the kids call it now? Like pedal core or like crescendo core, where the guys oh, are just, you know, just, like, just like you know, explosions in the sky type. You know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Post rock, Steve Black Emperor. For exactly. Example. At this point, yeah. at this point, that's like a twenty-year-old, thirty-year-old genre. So Gen uh, Z is gonna call it what they want. Yeah. Um, so funny. But, uh, oh my god. But, yeah, I like that's. I listen to that stuff too. I of course grew up, like I like that's those people. I feel like that's yeah. like the uh, that's an important step for a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> but when I was like sixteen, uh, it was you know college is becoming a question, and I hadn't been playing. Uh, I hadn't been playing piano like in any formal way and I would failed the AP music theory class in my high school. Uh, like like F failed. Right. And with that, the teacher who was a uh, also my choral instructor was like, You're not I don't think you're cut out for like composition max because like right. you're not you don't you can't handle my particular cookie cutter style of yeah like of teaching from like a 19th century harmony perspective, you know? Yeah. And it's wow. like, who would have thought <laughs> that there would be other places and programs that exist where they don't teach fundamentals exactly like that? Because yeah. like how many people like us have heard that before, you know, like how many sure. people who were devoted like emotionally to being a musician from like a young age, you know, like being like impressionable and like a bit vulnerable and, and like how many people like us have been told that before. It's really, it's really saddening. And it's really something that I really want to address is like, yep. you know, there's like, there's so many different ways and, and there's something that's so great about figuring out your own way, but you also, shouldn't have to be so determined that you can you can bounce back from being like you know shut down so so like uh so directly like that you know like I think I think that's something that that needs to needs to be addressed in I think it needs to be there's a few different there's a few different layers to that that I've tried to address in different parts of my teaching practices. But the first and foremost is like we give like we give K through 12 and specifically like high school music teachers, uh, we give them the keys to the gate, yeah. you know, like they are the gatekeepers, literally, um, exactly. because if you have no formal music classroom education up to that point, 
Um, and this is assuming your school has a music department, right? Yeah. Because this is yeah. another thing. The, the, the class issue is a different thing entirely. Course, but if, if you are as lucky as we, you and I are to be in a K-12 through uh, experience as well as a family experience where you can do it DIY and resist against archaic teachers, yeah. you still have those archaic teachers that are going to be the ones writing your letters of recommendation or even being the emotional pedagogical support that you need. Absolutely. Now, we're talking, we're, when we're talking about like access to education period, um, you know, when I was in graduate school, I started a nonprofit, which still exists, but I'm not running it as much anymore called Sonic Arts for All, which was uh, specifically geared towards music tech education for K through 12. Um, because like, we're talking about how many people get turned away from music classes because they don't have necessarily background interest in this one way of traditional music thinking. But uh -huh. like, what if you, what if you learned piano at church and you don't even play jazz, you don't read music, you don't play jazz music necessarily, yeah. but you yeah. have, you've been, you've been taught in a certain way and you have raw talent. Yeah. But the genre, your style, whatever, doesn't fit into this cookie cutter uh, arrangement that your your public schools or your K through twelve situation might have. Now, what if you are into hip hop? What if you are into any sort of popular music that you don't even necessarily need instrumental fundamentals to yeah. begin learning? Right, Absolutely. because you have a phone you have an iPad or your parents laptop you have a studio if you have if you have the the right resources to figure out how to do it yourself you can yeah, but that sure. doesn't mean that that doesn't mean that educators are going to see the merit in you you know yeah. yeah and that's the problem that's the biggest problem is that we have it's an archaic mindset because <laughs> even if even if these these people these 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 gatekeeper crotchety music teachers that we're talking about knew even about or accepted the existence of like Sun Ra and John Cage, then sure. they would see, then they would see you, the beat maker or the noise guitarist or the punk rocker 16 year old, they would see that there is potential to put you into some type of conservatory setting where you can be you can let your freak flag fly to an extent, right? Yeah. yeah. But to be like, no, yeah. I I yeah. have the keys, and you yeah. failed my AP theory literal textbook class. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. And who would have thought that like being when you when the, that type of professor and this the, this is specific <laughs> anecdote to the teacher that put me down when I was sixteen and seventeen. When I asked them, how can we apply this, I don't know, AP theory technique to like contemporary music, he said, and I quote, contemporary music. Oh, you mean like Billy Joel? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that was where, that was the end of the line yeah. for yeah. contemporary <laughs> popular music. Yeah. And this guy wasn't even Fuck like, in, it was like in his early 40s. What excuse do, could you possibly have for yeah. being that? that dull musically yeah. and as a result and as a result that uh i guess uh like conservative as a pedagogue you know yeah. how can you how can you do that we need a uh, critical music education needs to happen at every level k through 12 all the way up to phd right yeah yeah absolutely yeah um, yeah, there's so many different, there's definitely so many different components to that. I wonder if we could talk about um, maybe using music history as we've been talking about different like styles of music that come from different like cultural and class contexts, mm -hmm. um, like using music history as a way of sort of reviving and sort of like healing these, uh, these divisions that, um, you know, that you and I clearly are against. Um, so like one of the things that like, if, if you're new to my channel, one of the things that I try and do is talk about 
Um, people like Wendy Carlos, who is actually the subject of the video that I'm currently working on right now. It's a funny Hell question yeah. earlier. Um, people who have been sort of, who have made these, you know, these major contributions to so many different areas of, um, of, of the world of music and things that we all know and understand, but maybe don't know where they come from. Um, and, but then, and then also, you know, so there these, there's these, these people and the people that I've covered so far, like Julius Eastman and Daphne Orm have come from, are, they're all still coming from a sort of institutional context, right? Like they're, they've all studied in, in institutions and they've, you know, to a large part, like, you know, even though they face significant barriers when, when like through their, their careers and, and through being remembered in history through, you know, because of their identities, um, yeah. we're still able to, um, to kind of play these games and live in these worlds, right? Like, uh, both, both Eastman, I don't, I don't remember what Orem's education is, but, um, both Eastman and, and Wendy Carlos, like both were, are, are slash were like incredibly talented tonal music. Like they can, they can do yeah. this, this thing. Um, Eastman. Eastman up in uh, in Buffalo, right? Yeah, in Buffalo, and went to like a fancy um, a fancy conservatory for his his like bachelor whatever right, right. Uh, yeah. stage. Um, but like as you say, there's this whole other world. Like, well, there's multiple different worlds, right? There's like the underground, under you know, like if we could say there's like institutional and underground and pop music. Like, I think there's a lot to be said for sort of leveling out these different associations that we have with these kinds of music and also incorpor incorporating like what we can learn um, from all of these different styles into a music education that that doesn't like that doesn't say like these are you know these are the institutional musicians who you know who you should know and then you can go figure out you know you can go learn about hip hop on your own time or like learn about noise music yeah. on your own time um, so like, I guess if we want, we should keep it, uh, let's keep the conversation related to like our 20th and 21st century, like electronic leaning world. Cause sure. obviously yeah. we bring in the classical history. There's just so much history, right. You know, right. um, or like, you know, cause I, I had to teach, uh, American music through global, like global history musicology class when I was an adjunct and it was okay. basically American history of colonialism through a musical lens, but that's just so much yeah, history. It's right? a, yeah. <laughs> a lot. Um, but with elect that class. <laughs> yeah, electronic music though, it's great because we can really, you know, we can, we can trace it back a century and have it kind of in this, uh, in this very, you know, uh, I guess doable timeline that we can, like you said, sort of divide into i don't know like high art electronic music if you want to call mm -hmm. it the underground experimental electronic music mm -hmm. and the popular and the popular mm -hmm. uh, recording electronic music yeah. and obviously the popular is the only thing that is like is the most prevalent in every category musically now, like because right. all the popular music is electronic nowadays. Yeah, but yeah. Even like you said, talking about how do we like, how do we try to bridge these historic, uh, or rather these these categories? How do we bridge these categories using history? Mm -hmm. It's like for any music teacher, especially electronic music teacher that is going to talk about music concrete as the beginning of the conversation, but not lead that towards sampling and turntablism as right. part of the future of that conversation. Right. Like you're just being, it's another example of willful ignorance because yeah. you have these, you have the same like DSP engineers that are working at universities for the sake of making like, like John Chowning making the making uh, his own weird FM stuff, and then his right. patent becomes the DX7, right? And yeah, that's right, that's which the, is the most ubiquitous synth like ever, pop, ever, yeah, you know, yeah. ever popular music in the history of popular music. That's the yeah. synthesizer. Right? Such a good so, like, there's so, so many tech examples 
that in history have put the same trajectory of you know development into multiple sonic or musical uh environments that academics and journalists and certain types of you know maybe institutions are the ones that put up the walls mm -hmm. but the listeners not necessarily no. because you you look at you look at the like Jay Dilla's record collection and he has Stockhausen in there. You look, yeah. At, yeah. You look at the history of techno, they're listening to Kraftwerk and Kraftwerk studied with Stockhausen. So exactly. it's like there Absolutely. are so many <laughs> and I don't even like Stockhausen personally, but he right. he and friggin' Paul McCartney was obsessed with Stockhausen. So yeah. it's like yeah. you can't you can't take away popular music you can't subtract danceable electronic music from the high art academic conservatory or concert hall you know cajun post cajun uh yeah. world right yeah. and then in the middle you have i think you can call whether we call it noise or experimental ind independent experimental underground that's kind of like a perfect marriage of the two because we're coming at it from a often consumer electronic and consumer hobbyist uh perspective like mm. being self-taught noise artists being self-taught building their own instruments or mm -hmm. you know trash or lack of instruments for yeah. them you know right. um you know that's very punk to me yeah and you know it's kind of the punk which is in the pop rock and roll side of things you know yeah. taking a punk a punk mentality and applying it to the tools that you would see starting music concrete um that's to right. me that's where we find our little indie independent underground noise experimental world that right. is not making is not making stuff for top 40 you know for to, for the sake of giving it out to major labels but is also not trying to write a phd dissertation on this particular max patch you know what i mean yeah. like yeah yeah it's it's tough but the tech tells the story in in history specifically i mean okay wendy carlos right there is a great example because she like she's making a classical music switched on bach right you yeah. know she's yeah. she's she's making quote unquote safe accessible old music that yeah. you know your that her great grandparents loved or whatever yeah right but the device and yeah. this is kind of tapping into what you know i guess became the spectacle of technology but like just seeing bach with the moog modular on the cover yeah. people are like what the heck is this you know yeah. Yeah. not only not only classical older normie people but the pop music world, of course, you know it. Of course, Wendy, Wendy, Wendy was was a perfect uh, was the was the uh, personification of this marriage of popular and conservatory music cultures uh -huh. sort of uh, merging, mm -hmm. and it's and it's solely because of her choice of of her arsenal of tools. Yeah, you know, yeah. because she wouldn't be who she was if she was scoring and doing her rearrangements for Bach for chamber ensemble of like course, right? of course right? yeah yeah well and it goes yeah it definitely and I feel like also you know later in her career getting involved in like these non-octave repeating scales um using computer uh right. computer, like digital synthesis to realize these um these whole this whole other world of ideas that she has also sort of I mean I feel like the you know the microtonal world just intonation world is still still very very small and I feel like I, I can I can right. imagine it growing in the future I hope it does um, but right. you can see how that like that there's always yeah like I think I think that that point that you make about um, how the musicians themselves are are in general not really living according to these um these divisions at all like i i think that that really i mean you could probably just pick uh, like any significant musician and probably draw all these connections between the the different worlds um 
that really especially now it, I think that's it, a really it, smart now in the now in the in the age of uh consumer technology and information you know like because I feel like cages yeah. the 50s and 60s like even when Wendy and Pauline uh, and Daphne and people were getting their start in the mid 20th century. You yeah. know, that's like first wave. That must have been entirely uh, resistance, right? At our age, yeah. through both through both being able to buy technology without having to work for the government radio station, you know, yeah. What I mean? yeah. Like, stuff like that, and, or having a, a hundred thousand dollars worth of a synthesizer the size of your fridge. In, yeah, or in a half house a million, and depending on depending on right. when. Exactly, exactly. We we uh, have we, we have so many more tools and have had so many more tools the past few decades that, yeah, like you're saying, the musicians, uh, those that are pushing themselves uh, through their own means and of getting new information and new sounds available to them, they're not drawing these lines necessarily, mm -hmm. and. The ones historically often are the ones that don't draw those lines either, right? You know, yeah. I mean, like say what you want about like Paul McCartney, but you know, and like he, you know, he listened to a shitload of stuff and yeah, you know, totally it made him very successful. <laughs> yeah, well, and I feel like anyone, you know, I think anyone who's really who's driven. I mean, maybe maybe not entirely. Like, there's probably some people who are really, really just obsessed with like a certain area of of music. But I feel like and like you know, anyone who is, is just driven by their interest in music, it's like, why, like, how would you not be curious? Like, you're just, you just yeah. want to know, you just want to know different stuff. You're, and then, and then, you know, there's obviously in these various worlds, there's so much, uh, there's so much brilliance to, to behold that I think like anyone who's, who's not really boxing themselves in or feeling boxed in, feeling like they have to follow like a specific, a specific narrative would just naturally want to do that because it's like, it's all, all the better for, for you to have these diverse um, influences. It's a Rolodex, it's a Rolodex of, of, of history that you can reference. I think that part of the problem is <clears throat> the culture of, Music academia is that like it, once you get your pe once you write your thesis, like you've stopped learning. Yeah, like, you know, like once you yeah. once you get to what would be the highest level, like PhD of like music academic, and you have a ten year track, it's like you've learned, you've reached your pinnacle of knowledge, and now everything past you in the future is is no longer relevant to your practice right. which is most likely going to be a teacher if you're getting yeah. a phd yeah. you're most likely going to be a teacher so yeah. to me the culture it's a culture of people learning from and taking the word as law, like taking the word as law from mm -hmm. teachers from teachers who are oftentimes not willing or sometimes just intimidated by sure. the new th the new things that come after they stopped being a, a, officially a student themselves but yeah. you know that yeah I think that's like critical education really critical music education and critical education or critical pedagogy in general to me just means like no matter what degree you have like some student might come in and just like blow you away with something you've never heard absolutely. of before absolutely yeah you know? absolutely and i feel like you know hopefully hopefully we can work towards a world where uh, right. teachers want like would 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 hope for that you know i think yeah. um and you know i think another thing it's interesting you, you know you think about i mean this is something that i experienced and i don't maybe i don't know what what you think about this but like um i feel a lot of pressure to to come across as authoritative enough i think um and i wonder you know i think you're speaking about these professors and stuff. I mean, I know it's, it's different because, um, you know, you're talking about educated, fully educated professors who are working in institutions versus me on YouTube, like who's... Don't talk, don't talk yourself down. There's no... Well, just, just different contexts, right? Like there's okay. a different, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, there's like they're teaching people who paid to be there and I'm trying to reach a yeah, wide right. audience gotcha. of people who, you know, like... Want to I stumble, don't know who they want to stumble are. across it, right? Exactly. Um, but you know, I think that there's probably, I think, 
again, one, one feels pressure to be authoritative and, and have people take what they're saying seriously, or at least I feel this. Um, and it feels hard to toe the line between being like, okay, well, yeah, there's like, there's lots that there's like so much that I don't know. And there, there always will be like, it doesn't matter how much I learn. There will always be so much more that I will know. And I will die not knowing so much about the world of music. Um, yet at the same time, like, yeah. I want people to take what I say seriously. And, and like, you know, yeah. like I work really hard to, to, to know, like to be saying things that are accurate and that are, that are true. I mean, I think it's like being, as a teacher, as a teacher, it's like finding the, it's to me, it's like accepting that the history of all art is people that have learned a series of rules to break them. And then those rule breakers become the next rule writers. And then the next set of people break those rules after they learn them. Right. So to me though, they're, the trajectory, at least in our contexts of educator versus student, to mm -hmm. me, like what being critical means also means like accepting that there are rules and that you might not know everything coming in. And if you're taking a class, the expectation is that you're taking something you don't know yeah. so that you can learn it. Yeah. But as a teacher, you should, you should also accept that at the end of the day, these people are going to take what you say and potentially flip it on its ass and make something entirely different, which will have its own merits that you might not even see. Like, I'm not saying like, I love all the music that my pe my students are making. Right. And yeah. I, I'm not saying I love all music period as a, I'm a human being. Right. Yeah, of course. But I accept that there will be merit uh, artistic and, and intellectual merit in things beyond my immediate scope of personal training and taste, right? Right. right so right. as a teacher, it's like, I'm going to unload what I know will get you through the door. Yeah. And whether you expand specifically upon my school of thought, yeah. or take that, take that as a pivot to a new direction based okay. on and do exact opposite of what I tell you. Yeah, reject that, it entirely even. Exactly. That's what I did to so many of my teachers, right? Who yeah. am I to tell who am I to tell you not once we're done with our lesson, not go and do something completely totally. different, right? And I think totally. I think you have to accept that. And, you know, as as far as being authoritative enough, it means like, you know, giving enough structure in an assignment or a prompt or a lecture uh -huh. that will have uh that will there were are facts that need to be laid out right yeah, yeah. whether it's historical technical from a composition or technological side whatever yeah. there are facts that need to be laid out but i do not present them to you as like aesthetically the only option yeah, <laughs> right yeah, because yeah. Aesthetics is another, <laughs> you could take, you could be as trained as you want or as intentionally self taught as you want. And aesthetics can end up being exactly the same, right? I always make this yeah. argument of like free jazz versus like Milton Babbitt. If you were listening to like both of them, if it was like Anthony Braxton improvised ensemble structured improv score versus a Milton Babbitt orchestra score. If right. you close your eyes, if you close your eyes, would you uh, be able really to tell me what's free improv and what is maximal serialist mathematics, right? right? right. Like at the end of the day, aesthetics might just be chaos. That's your aesthetic, you know, like right. Right. whether you learn it through theory or through hard life experience, whatever. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Aesthetic will always be different. I can't force that on a student. That's the end of the thing. You know? Right. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's an interesting um, that's an interesting thing to think about. I feel like I have I have so many like associations with serialism. I think it would be hard to not hear Milton Babbitt and have some have some very specific <laughs> feelings about it. But yeah, but I ran, your point, I ran, your point I ran in away. I ran away from that. Uh, like, by the yeah. end of my bachelor's by the end of my bachelor's is like if i have to learn more math i'm not getting a master's degree like you better have a, a noise and sonic arts only trajectory for me because right. i'm not going down this path <laughs> yeah 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 and i think you know i mean even you could i mean now that i think about it like our 
our conversation right now is largely like is what you're saying it's our own version of it right like i I mean, I have a ton of respect for the professors that I had. Like I, you know, those people impacted my like intellectual and creative life in such a significant way. Um, and I feel so grateful for their impact on it. But at the same time, I, you know, here I am doing a, doing a, like a, a, a Zoom talk about the things that I, I disagree with with what what they did, right? And they made that program. So it's being critical, you know, it's no disrespect to them. It's exactly. just this is the big. This is the issue uh, that is that almost basically at the root of the meme page is that you can be critical and like stuff. You know, yeah. like you can yeah. you can appreciate and adore it and respect right. the hell out of it and be as nitpicky as you want. You know, right. like that is the that's the issue in a culture of musicianship that we mostly cringe at and which is um, which is why we have elitism in the conservatories based on virtuosity, like which also translates to like six set bro culture in like yeah. DIY shows, which is right. like we see each other as threats because we don't want to say like. I like this and that, and it scares me how good you are at this versus like, yeah. I don't like this. I don't like this, but here's the thing that I do. Like, we can't, we can't be, <laughs> we have so much emotion charged behind our music oh that we're God. unable to, we're unable to talk critically and remain friends. Like, <laughs> it's, Absolutely. It's, it's a hard, hard. <laughs> it's a hard, uh, it's a hard line to toe. Yeah. I, yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot. I'm also, I'm also sort of, I have this other video in the works about just making like creating things in our current economic context. And I think, you know, right. I think that I don't think that it's just as simple as like being like, oh, you know, capitalism pits us in in competition from uh, in one another in competition with one another. Um, and that's why we feel threatened by each other's work. Like there's probably something a little bit more like lizard brain going on there that you're also like hitting on. It's but all, it's, it's all also I, but I think it's also very real. Right. Like we, yeah. you know, there's uh, there's like a very there's a very small like set of resources available to people who create things and i think we really feel i feel like i feel threatened you know by so like the so many things that people do like that i that i love and i find i mean at this point i'm sort of just like i'm i i it's almost like a new analytical tool that i have as being like okay i i'm feeling threatened by this why do i what about it makes me feel threatened it's an interesting way of actually learning about the piece of work or learning about yourself or for sure for sure uh, or whatever that but that's a huge thing also following the gut the gut instinct right it's like you know more what is what is a threat does a threat mean like you know it could be a positive in the end because it's just like a learning experience for like a, a another artist that you're like holy shit like they're doing it's exactly what i want my sound to be you know yeah, what i mean and, yeah 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 that happens to so many people, but it's to it's like you said, the combination of like upbringing and inse personal insecurities that have almost nothing to do with art sometimes, yeah. as well as the market influence, right? Because yeah. you're, there is a small pool of resources, and like any other industry, it comes down to who know who can uh, you know who you can really like uh, schmooze. <laughs> Totally. It's an industry. It's an it's industry. Lot, and it becomes, yeah. it becomes very dog eat dog in a way. Um, I don't know. Definitely, to me, to me, at this point, like I when I was I lived in New York for ten years and was playing and working all of these DIY or underground venues and just like the culture of being in a band at a show with four other acts who you don't know that's been booked by the venue. Right. And none of you guys talk to each other or even want to be around while the other one plays. Like you just hang out outside yeah. and smoke and drink until it's time for your time yeah. to play. Yeah, it's and then you so six set bro yeah. in passing, right? You yeah. know, like yeah. it's a culture it's a culture of I guess it, it and yeah, it could be it could be like seeing them as like well that's the band that was gonna get the deal and not us or whatever yeah, yeah. but 
but like <laughs> when you realize like any other labor mar- labor pool when you realize that it's like power and numbers and like all the things that we want like they need people like us at the at the top they need people like us at the bottom to make it work yeah. it's never culture is never trickle down yeah. it always trickles up and sometimes it takes a few people with it up to the top but very rarely does that happen it's mostly they just take the culture yeah. and allow and allow the people who know each other to continue to rise up together yeah. so it becomes it becomes a a business and a like anything else it's going to be dog eat dog and who has the most resources and when people are left to their own devices for the most part i feel like we're going to unfortunately fight it out when there's only like one piece of pizza left you know yeah <laughs> like, yeah yeah just... so i wonder That's if how we, it is if we can bring this back to our own like what you know so it just begs the question like well what do we you know so we've identified this issue and obviously we don't we're, we don't have all the answers um but i think it one of the things that i've, I've been thinking about also is um you know trying to give people access to good education um that doesn't involve needing to go to a, a fancy institution where like in right. in the u.s it's you know, a huge, 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 huge financial commitment that like most people just can't, can't make. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think another thing that, you know, I mean, like I'm on, on YouTube, so everything that I do is uh, available for free and is just crowdfunded on, on Patreon or whatever. And, um, and your, your Patreon is pay what you can. Um, Yeah. If you, you know, if you have $12 a year for this education, then you can do it rather than, you know, whatever, $12,000 a semester or something. Exactly. Um, so I think I, this, I, is, this I, is one way. That it, I think it's we rooted in politics. It's, it's rooted in politics. Again, the, the, yeah. that same thing. You're exactly what you're talking about. And, it, you know, even the YouTube, even YouTube, uh, just, you know, Obviously, all of these major platforms are evil, Facebook, Google, Absolutely. whatever, but they all have their maximal beneficial uses as free platforms that uh, separate from monet- monetizing as just as a, as an accessible free thing. Uh, we, yeah. can't den- we can't deny the usage of that, or yeah. the ben- beneficial nature of that, whether or not they're dating us. It's separate. Whether, um, not, whether or not what? Sorry. Whether or not mining data from us yeah, is is a right. separate separate conversation. Yeah, but totally. The fact of the fact that the resource exists and allows someone in I don't like God knows where to just go on YouTube and search like electronic music education and find your page and yeah. suddenly have learned what da- who Daphne Orem is like that's you know that's special yeah. that's something that 50 50 years ago or less well, 25 you know yeah. Like, yeah. 20 15 Jesus yeah. YouTube's been yeah. around 15 years now <laughs> yeah. yeah maybe the last thing that we want to sort of hit on here is um, is talking about in- involving like sort of have involving symbolism um, and understanding the references um, and not necessarily even concept, like concept could be sort of further down that, down that road, but like just being like, oh, you know, maybe being like, okay, well, I like this particular like, you know, musical chunk here because it reminds me of these things and then being like, well, why? Why does that thing matter? What is it about that thing that appeals to you? Right. How does that relate to your own self-understanding and your practice and like what is your sort of how does that relate to like what the point of what you're trying to express is i guess um and that's a big one that's a big one (laughs) it's a big one and i think well so for me in my program that was like completely left out and it's it's so interesting because a lot of a lot of my friends uh, like a lot of people that i know have been in art school and they're sort of like, well, if you didn't do that, like, what were you learning exactly? <laughs> you know, like, I was just, I've been thinking, like, well, why, you know, I, 
I, I really like a lot of 80s Japanese pop music and um, and like new age stuff or whatever. And that that really is like a big reference point for my work. And I was just like, I was just like, but why? Like, I don't mm-hmm. actually, I don't know. Like, why do I care about this particular like culture and subculture so much? Like it's um, something that that like, in this whole, you know, experience of being educated in music, it's like a, a kind of an intellectual or like a reflective analytical framework that is just like t- totally missing from from my personal experience. And um, I think that's kind of sad. Who's the rock star uh, ambient boomer? It's like William Basinski, right? Like who's like the at the top of the... Not not the Eno, but the next generate post Eno, but pre millennial uh, yeah. ambient rock star would be would be Basinski, right? Yeah. Like, you know, like not necessarily in the sound like the post rock world, still coming in from this composer world, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And Basinski talk about symbolism, like <laughs> disintegration loops is yeah. famous because of nine eleven. You know, not that I don't love it and haven't seen him perform that mm. live and cried, right. you know, in, it is in New like York. That. Yeah. You know, it is like that and it yeah. does bring that and it means a lot to especially like musicians and experimental folks in New York. Um, but like, and I could see that in the audience when I saw it, I'm from Boston originally. So like I was not in New York, I would have, mm-hmm. I was 10 years old and, and in Boston during nine 11. So right, right. Different, different situation, but you see the importance of certain, certain pieces, uh, and how they resonate with entire generations, not even like mm-hmm. sonically, on its own, but just like its existence is just like, damn, you yeah. know? And obviously he, Basinski made it with a video component that just is 9-11 smoke, you know? Yeah. And so yeah. people, and some people will have a, a very hard time watching that, you know? And, mm-hmm. Or it just is very, it's too real for them. Mm-hmm. But like subtract the visual element, sound alone. Yeah. It's, it's just like, you, you hear the first, arpeggiation of the loop and you're just like oh god time to time to reflect to go on back america. yeah yeah time to think yeah, about america so yeah no kidding <laughs> yeah right not just not just the tragedy of 9 11 but everything i mean yeah the the wide 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 stretching symbolism of that event and everything yeah. that's happened around it's it. all analog it's all analogous whether he meant for it to be or not. I mean, he's very good at yeah. marketing it after the fact because it is a process piece of music that accidentally happened initially, right? right. And it's like, right. you know, but but a good artist is able to reflect retrospectively and articulate it into words. And Indeed. he said something. He said something about like you know like the 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 destruction or disintegration of the tape is like destroying what we knew of America and what right. is left is the is the post 9-11 modern era and that's right. uh right. it's true yeah <laughs> yeah true. yeah what are we left with we're not left with anything like we can't go to the airport like we used to in the 90s you know yeah totally. yeah yeah <laughs> and symbolic, more. symbolic yeah. of all of that <laughs> yeah yeah and I mean I guess that's it's so interesting right because you think of um you know, and obviously there there are probably some really great criticisms to make about um, about his his approach, and I don't really I haven't read what he's said about it or whatever. And obviously, like the other side of nine eleven, there's a lot of about America to to criticize. Um, of course, with that, um, but you know, even just in terms of like giving people an experience, like that ability to um, to synthesize these really, really, really huge events and, and give people this experience um, as a way to reflect on their own version of that event. Yeah. And, um, you know, were, like this, like this feeling that you're there. talking about of like, of being like, oh shit, I'm being brought back to this place. Like that is such an amazing thing that music can do and art can do. And, um, you know, if we just get, stuck in this like formalist obsession um 
you know, we lose, we lose the potential for that and so much more. Like I think, um, it's, it's the, why, the, why does it exist? You know, after, after the fact, 10 years after the fact, 20 years after, why does yeah. this matter? Yeah. Why did you write it? And why should I hear it? And why will it matter? Yeah. Those are like big questions that we shouldn't necessarily be forced to reckon with when we compose every bit of music. Of but course, of course. thinking about like thinking about not throwing the not throwing the, the what was it? I, I love the expression. The bathwater. Not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right. Yeah. It's like yeah, like you know, it, you can be formal. You can be formal in your own and and as traditionally musical or in, as heady serialist as inaccessible as you want but like at the end of the day it's got to mean something beyond the score it's got to mean to me at least and i'm assuming yeah. to you as well beyond yeah, the beyond the recording even if it's just a brief artist statement about what you are going through as a person while you wrote it not even yeah. your art artistic process but your just personal life where you wrote it or whatever and in, you know the case of like basinski it's like how do you get how do you get people in their 40s to just immediately start weeping when they hear a tape loop yeah like yeah. where else how the how else are you going to do that yeah. without a, yeah. without some sort of historic uh trajectory that has sustained the work it's yeah. still it still has the ability to hit you that hard like and bring you back to that and i was crying and i'm not from new york i was you know yeah. like i said like it means something totally different to me than it does to an actual new yorker sure. who's you know who was in their 20s when that happened yeah or how, however old however you know but whoever old, yeah. whoever was at the basinski concert that was really like immediately like like weeping it's like god damn like you know this means way more to you than it does to me and it might even mean more to them than it does to Basinski and just within the first three <laughs> right. seconds there was just like audible gasps coming from the audience within the first right. within the first okay. repetition of the loop right. and it was just like where where on earth are you going to have a piece of tape music even because because like Steve Reich and, and the I'm trying to think of like normie famous tape music like it's gonna rain or whatever like yeah. not that it's not great but that people know Donald Trump talks about Steve Reich you know um, really? in his book literally wow literally saying a great a great New Yorker that shows you how to make a lot from not much you know um, <laughs> that's Donald <laughs> Trump on that's Donald Trump on Steve Reich but okay, even, with Steve, even with Steve even with Steve Reich. Yeah, you got to look that up. Even with Steve Reich is like, it's going to rain or come out to show them. Like we've abst we've completely abstracted the original meaning of those recordings. There's no social, when I hear come out to show them, I'm not thinking about the civil rights movement like Steve Reich was because right. the, piece was, the piece was the piece itself. It meant to him the riots that he was, ex that he was seeing yeah, in yeah, LA yeah. in the 60s. But it didn't mean that necessarily to his listeners, especially 50 years on. So like yeah. somebody like Basinski, somebody like Basinski is able to make like wrap up New York symbolism of 2001 in a single tape loop. Like that's something special, whether or not he's like, you know, milking that cow sure, or not. You sure. know, it's true. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. It, it means something. Yeah, well, this ability to to create something that like has that sort of sustains, you know, and like to speak to the fact that you know it it has an emotional impact on me too, and I'm Canadian. I was like yeah. seven, you know, yeah. when yeah. that happened. Like I didn't know anything about yeah. politics or whatever, you know, but I knew it was a huge deal. And like, I think you know this this ability to create something that that. Um, that sustains beyond its its original moment, like that that communicates widely, is also super super key. Like I think you know, I think some of the music that some of the pop music that I really really love, like Frank Ocean or something, where it's just like mm -hmm. he expresses melancholy so well, and it's like yeah. there's something so cathartic for me about listening to the melancholy that he's able to express. 
Right. And I don't know really much about him as a person. I don't right. know what he's really singing about. Like I have ideas. I have, I know a few stories and, you know, you kind of project them onto there, but it doesn't really matter. Like yeah. it's not, you know, there's, there's something that's going beyond the moment or the, the specific thing that he's trying to express. It has some kind of staying power that allows a lot of different people to project their own kinds of experiences and meanings onto it that, that really creates, you know, really important experiences for a lot of people, which is really cool. Everybody could have, everyone can benefit from listening to pop music that has some sort of effect like that on you, yeah. like yeah. regardless of how much you know about the artist or even if you care to know about that much about the artist, but just on hook and production alone is able to just reel you in and make you feel, bring you to melancholy or bring yeah. you to, bring you to I want to dance, bring you to yeah. romance and like, or like loneliness or whatever, like, that is something that's why pop music is popular because it it yeah. has the ability it has the ability to tap in to the most streamlined way of sonically connecting musically connecting with beyond the conservatory and concert hall uh audiences you know yeah. or, you know or that's why it's replaced those as far as mo what's most popular totally. in the world totally great well, have, have a great rest of your day you too. And what time is it there now? It's it's one. It's one. Go enjoy. Damn, it's, it's, it's already dark coffee. here. Now. Yeah. <laughs> Go have some lunch. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'll see you later. Okay. Bye bye.